Tonight, frustrated with an increase in crime. It's unfair, right? Well, each time we pay by pocket. Business owners and residents say they're dealing with more break-ins since the opening of a respite center nearby. Plus... This is dirty. It's gross. <laughs> the stinky reputation of Toronto's beaches goes way back, but it turns out it's all a myth now. And... There's cotton candy, photo booth. It's just amazing. It's a night to remember. SickKids Hospital hosts a prom for its patients. Residents and business owners in Liberty Village say they've seen an increase in crime since the December opening of the St. Felix Respite Center. Now they're calling for solutions from the city. Chris Glover has more. The second time, the two door. The first door and the second they door. They smashed through both doors. Yeah, because we locked both doors, right? So After eight years of no trouble, happened. this nail salon has been broken into three times in a few months. This damage just happened overnight Wednesday. See, he broke it and he go by that one. See that? Oh, gosh. They no longer keep money here overnight. They break down like everything, right? Because he wrote that. But between damage and stolen cash, the owner says they've lost $3,000. And she blames the nearby respite center. Right now, all the time, it's scary. Like, when you sleep, you not feel very good sleeping, right? I, I would think it's important to not lose sight of the fact that that is a very small minority of the, the people. The executive director says most businesses in the area support the respite center for helping the city's homeless. We provide a place to rest, people can sleep, get food, take a shower, uh, access clean clothing. Now it's almost like we have to kind of be aware of certain things that we did before. But a short walk and you find the nail salon certainly isn't alone. When this employee from a nearby barber shop walked in today, she found several used drug needles. It was really dangerous because they were just everywhere. Um, so that is something definitely not usual in this neighborhood, um, so it was quite scary um, to see. But the staff at this catering company says despite the increase in problems, the center is sadly needed. There's no like ideal place for the center to be held and it still needs to be there because people still need it. I live downtown myself and I don't think that there's any part of the city that is totally immune from the impact of poverty. The center says it works to mitigate those problems. For example, when things like drug needles are left behind, their community safety team responds seven days a week from 7 a.m. until 1 a.m. They don't have anywhere else to go, and so they're going to go where the programs exist until such time as permanent, deeply affordable, supportive housing is available. But let's give you an update on affordable housing in Toronto. Right now, the wait list is 181,000 people long. So that's still a big job ahead. But the city says another solution is more permanent shelter spaces. And uh, as far as that is concerned, there are 1,000 new shelter beds that are expected to be opened by 2020. Chris Glover, CBC News, Toronto. An Ontario minister swearing at a senator? Well, that's what Lisa McLeod is being accused of. And the tongue lashing was apparently directed at Ottawa Senator's owner, Eugene Melnick. Now there are calls for McLeod's resignation. Mike Crawley has more. It happened at last weekend's Rolling Stones concert in a field north of Barrie, Ontario. Before the Stones took the stage, the crowd got an official welcome from Ontario's Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport, Lisa McLeod. On the sidelines of the show, McLeod confronted Eugene Melnick, owner of the NHL's Ottawa Senators. According to two Ottawa newspapers, Melnick says the cabinet minister hurled abuse at him, used the F word twice, called him a loser and a piece of SHIT. McLeod is not denying it happened. This morning on Twitter, the cabinet minister said she gave Melnick some feedback and says she apologized for being so blunt. Ontario's official opposition is questioning whether McLeod should remain in cabinet. That is um, certainly a decision that uh, Mr. Ford's going to have to make about what he considers to be uh, the quality uh, that he expects and the behavior of his ministers. So far, I would say that it's been pretty appalling. Neither McLeod nor Melnick could be reached for comment today. In a statement, the Ottawa senators say Melnick stands by his version of what happened. Melnick spoke with Premier Doug Ford, 
and says he was impressed with how Ford handled the situation. McLeod has been one of Ford's most controversial ministers through his first year in power. She faced criticism for her handling of the autism program as Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Ford demoted her to Tourism, Culture and Sport Minister last month. Today, the Premier's office declined to comment. Mike Crawley, CBC News, Toronto. And it appears again tonight that Lisa McLeod addressed the controversy on her Twitter account, saying, quote, I regret my inappropriate remarks and apologize for them. I have spoken with Mr. Melnick, offered to meet him, and would be happy to do so anytime. The PC government also under fire after axing yet another high-ranking bureaucrat, hours after the Toronto Star reported ties to the Premier's former chief of staff, Dean French. And the NDP are not buying that Doug Ford has nothing to do with this. Frankly, the, the Premier is lying. It's pretty clear. And he needs to come out and actually start to, to talk about what has happened, what his relationship is. I don't have any confidence. I don't think Ontarians have any confidence in the government carrying out or Mr. Ford carrying out his own internal review of appointments. It's like putting the fox in charge of the hen house. He clearly has no interest in actually cleaning anything up, and he only makes a decision like that when he's found out. This is the fourth government appointment that has been revealed to have personal ties to French. Peter Fenwick will be leaving the public service effective immediately, according to a memo shared with CBC News. The NDP and the Liberals have been calling for the PC government to run an external review of public appointments under the PC government. The Premier has commissioned an internal review. If you take a look around, you might think I'm in California at a music festival, but it's actually Promcella right here in Toronto at SidKids Hospital. I'm Hoya Fidel for CBC, and coming up, we speak with some teens about tonight's special event. When I was on the ground, I took my shoes off and my feet were hot, but then I went in the water and my feet were cold. And now I'm happy that it's hot because the water was cold. <laughs> Very hot and humid, but it feels like summer is finally here, I guess. <laughs> well, it was a hot one today, but it looks like the heat didn't scare Torontonians away. Lots of little ones taking advantage of those splash pads. Jeff Harrington is here with our first look at the weather. Obviously, we're talking about the heat today. And Magda, we did it. For the first time in more than nine months, we hit 30 degrees at Pearson. More details on that coming up. Hanging on to the heat and humidity. We'll time out when it will end. Some more rain and storms to go on Saturday. And then finally, we'll get back to more average temperatures. So this morning, we were upgraded. Our special weather statement was upgraded to a full-blown heat warning. The high heat and humidity will continue through Saturday. We had a humid X today of 40. And tomorrow, it will get pretty close there. Yep, there we go. There's a 30 degree day. Uh, Windsor hit 33 today. In terms of our next batch of moisture, I think it will roll in as we head toward early on Saturday. We'll get a break, maybe some peaks of sun, and then toward the afternoon, look for showers around Hamilton to St. Catharines. Talking about tonight, not much relief. 22 is going to feel about 27. And Makda, tomorrow is going to feel about 38. Wow. All right. Thank you, Jeff. You got it. I'm Talia Ricci. Seniors who gather at community centers say the fun has been taken out of their game time as the city enforces new rules around gambling. They're just giving the poor old seniors a runaround. But spoils the game. I'll have that story coming up. For many teenagers, prom is a night to remember. And one hospital makes sure it's a milestone that patients don't miss out on. The Hospital for Sick Children hosted its 11th annual prom, and Harwaya Fidel was there. It's hello dance floor, goodbye doctors for 25 teens and their guests tonight. I've been looking forward to this all year. Teens who spent part or all of their high school experience in the hospital got the chance to let loose and have some fun at Sick Kids Prom. Jennifer Wilton enjoyed the full experience, getting her hair and makeup done. Earlier this year, I went in the hospital for two months, and I was on a lot of steroids, and they really puffed out my face. And so I haven't really felt a lot like myself lately, but like being here today and getting my hair and makeup done, it like makes me feel a lot more like myself. 
Wilton spent most of her high school years in and out of the hospital after she was diagnosed with a genetic disease. She attended her school prom, but says this one is different. I have friends who understand what it's like to be sick, and at my high school, it's a lot of activity and dancing, and I was sitting by myself. Organizers say events like this are to help teens feel more normal despite their circumstances. Children that are going through medical illnesses or long-term disabilities shouldn't miss out on these important events. This couple got to make up for lost time. I was actually in the hospital um, during my prom this year, so I didn't get to go. So when I heard about this, I was really excited. It was like a makeup for that. The room was decorated with giant floaties, a photo booth, and even some cactuses to go with this year's prom cello theme. For Vanessa Williams, tonight is bittersweet as she graduates out of the Sick Kids program. I'm leaving the place that's kind of nurtured me and gotten me to the where, place where I am today. Um, but it's also, I guess, something to celebrate. After Vanessa was diagnosed with anxiety, PTSD and panic disorder five years ago, her mother says it was hard to imagine moments like this. It was hard. It still is hard. To see her like this, you know, full of excitement, so happy. Like I, you know, like I forget all about her health issues at this, you know, at this moment. The event is open to patients aged 15 and up. Hawaii Fidel, CBC News, Toronto. Well, the buy-ins were $1.25, but a group of seniors have been told their games of euchre, bingo and cribbage are too pricey. The city is telling them entry fees are now limited to only a quarter. As Talia Ricci explains, the seniors say the city is sucking the fun out of their social time. Four hearts. I'll say five spades. A few seniors enjoying a game of cards and some friendly competition. I couldn't get it out for And the stakes are, well, the stakes are actually pretty low. We could only play for 25 cents. Well, that spoils the whole game because there's some skill in it and there's a little bit of, you know, we need the competitive juices going. Bill and June Haskins say they were playing for $1.25 for years. And usually it's a full house of seniors at the Stephen Leacock Community Centre. That's changed since the city started enforcing the new rules around games. People are walking out. 30 people have walked out of the bingo games. And they say really it's not about winning money. It's about bringing people together, socialising and having fun. Instead of sitting on a lazy bear watching TV, they're out. And they're about, and they're, they're, they look forward to seeing each other every week. In a statement to CBC News, the Alcohol and Gaming Commission of Ontario says, It is our understanding the City of Toronto received a complaint from a member of the public about games played in city community centres. Adding, the AGCO has offered to work closely with the City of Toronto to clarify the rules around charitable lottery licensing and to discuss options for these groups. The city confirms there was a complaint and now they're working with the province on a review. They're looking at entry fees in older adult programs and ensuring that there aren't any financial barriers so that everyone can participate. They're also making sure that the programs are compliant with legislation. <laughs> the aim is to have the review completed by the end of the year with some clear rules in place. But while they wait, the seniors say they're just not happy with the new hand they've been dealt. I think they're trying to dictate to us what us old people can do with our money. Why can't we just leave us alone for goodness sakes, you know? We're not doing anybody any harm. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. The city of Brampton is encouraging seniors to hop on public transit by offering them a deal. A monthly pass for $15. I'm glad it's the first city that's doing it for the seniors. Seniors are underrated sometimes and we've worked hard. So this is a good day. Um, I think it's great for us. At least we get a reward for all our years. <laughs> so this discounted pass is for seniors 65 years of age or older. It's for unlimited travel during that calendar month. And the pass goes on sale in August. And seniors can start using it on September 1st. This is the first step in the city's plans to implement free fares for Brampton seniors. So I am one of those people who swims in Toronto. I know some of you are probably watching this and cringing, but I can assure you that I have been doing this for years and I'm still in one piece. 
I'm Natalie Nanowski and I'll have more on just how clean Toronto's beaches are coming up. Waitress is People trying to stay cool with all this heat today could have visited one of Toronto's beaches for a swim, but some won't dare to go in, even though the city has done a lot to improve the quality of Lake Ontario's water. Natalie Nanowski looks at just how clean Toronto's beaches are. For some, Toronto's beaches are a pristine secret. For others, a cesspool. Would you swim in the water in Toronto? No. Definitely not. Why, why? Because uh, we're in Ontario and the water's disgusting. I am one of these people who swims in Lake Ontario. I know some of you guys right now are watching this and cringing, but I can assure you that I have been doing this for years and I'm still in one piece. Eight of Toronto's beaches are so clean, they meet international blue flag standards, meaning they have the same status as beaches along the Mediterranean coastline. In Toronto? Yes. Where? So it's beaches like Woodbine and Cherry, where lifeguards head out every morning during the summer to sample water for E. coli. E. coli is a good indicator for fecal contamination, and that can be from human waste or animal waste, and that often happens um, uh, from, say, storm runoff or just from, say, animals like birds. <laughs> Honestly, it wasn't always like this. Until about the 1960s, the water was gross. Toronto had grown so fast that sewage was a problem. But in the last 30 years, huge improvements have been made. Toronto built a stormwater detention tunnel in the west near Ontario Place and two tanks in the east to keep the lake clean. Outflows in the east and west ends of the city that captures the first few minutes of stormwater, which can be the most heavily contaminated, and will send it, uh, divert it to holding tanks um, to help protect uh, Lake Ontario from uh, a certain level of contamination. Wait, there is still more to be done. So yes, Toronto has some fabulous areas to swim in, but this is not one of them. Because hundreds of feet below where I'm standing, there's a massive sewage pipe. There are nine of those sewage pipes all in the core. When it rains, there is some overflow into the lake. The city doesn't test these areas because they're harbors and you're not supposed to swim in them. But organization Swim Drink Fish does test them for E. coli. Sometimes they pass and sometimes they fail. It's funny and I've been doing this for decades, but E. coli and bacteria is very local. So where you have pipes that are discharging into the lake or into the harbour, that's where you're going to see the problems. But the widespread contamination of the past is gone. We thought we were protecting people by keeping them out of the water. Really what we were doing was creating generations of kids who no longer believed. So that's what we're now having to overcome today. Those myths and really challenge them and give people the information that they need. So the rule of thumb, beaches are fine, harbours not just yet. Natalie Nanowski, CBC News, Toronto. And here's a look at our beautiful skyline tonight. Look a little closer and you will see a creepy visitor, your friendly neighborhood spider. Looks like it's running away from the rain. Jeff is back with another look at the weather. So should we be hanging on to our umbrellas tonight? Tonight and tomorrow will be a good bet, Magda. And look at this heat warning. It was towards southwestern Ontario. It's now been extended for a huge chunk of the province. We're finally there at that criteria. And it's not just because it's hot during the day. There's not a lot of relief at night. We'll show you what our temperatures are dipping down to. In terms of our daytime highs, this is important to point out. Toronto finally hit that 30-degree day. The last time this happened was September 21st, 2018. So it took us more than nine months to get there, but we did it today. Uh, the earliest it's happened in the season is April 25th and the latest, August 7th, in that year, 90, 1996. It was the only time it hit 30 degrees. Uh, here's where you'll need the umbrella, Magda, as we head towards Saturday morning. We'll get some breaks in there, hopefully some peaks of sun, and then by the afternoon, look at this, a batch of moisture setting up west end. Hamilton right toward uh, the St. Catharines area. It will clear out as we head towards Saturday evening and Sunday is going to be a picture-perfect day. 
much more comfortable weather on tap. Rainfall amounts shown us it's not too major. We'll expect anywhere from 10 to 20 millimeters. Lesser amounts as we head towards southwestern Ontario. Tonight, still keeping that risk that we could see some storms at about 60 percent. Windsor, you'll dip down to a low of 21. And tomorrow, 29. Again, keeping that risk in there. A Humidex value of about 38. Uh, for the GTA of along the Golden Horseshoe right now, look at this. Not much relief overnight. In fact, our Humidex uh, for the overnight hours will be pretty close to 30. Daytime high tomorrow of 29, and those winds could be gusty at times as well. Here we go now with your five-day forecast and when that relief is coming. So and tomorrow will be our last hot one, feeling about 38. Sunday, picture-perfect day, a mix of sun and cloud, a high of 24, and then we get into a beautiful stretch of weather, comfortable temperatures, average temperatures, for a few days, I should say, Makta, because by Tuesday, we start to see our Humidex creeping up again to about 33, but all in all, a much more comfortable forecast. Sounds good. Thanks, Jeff. You got it. Some mouth-watering news for all the foodies in the city. Summerlicious has officially kicked off in Toronto. We will take you to the launch after the break. Whether you're a foodie or you just want to try something new, don't miss this opportunity. Summerlicious is here. So beginning today from July 5th to July 21st, almost 200 of Toronto's top restaurants will offer a three-course three uh, prefix uh, lunch uh, and dinner. And it allows people in the very broadest way to sample uh, Toronto's food culture. And I think we sell ourselves short in a lot of areas in the city, but one that we don't focus on is just how excellent and how broad and how genuine uh, the food culture is that we have in the city. Summerlicious has become a popular culinary event here in Toronto. It was created by the city in 2003 to help boost the economy when business is slow. Since the program started, more than $331 million has been generated for the local restaurant industry. Summerlicious kicked off today at the Miku restaurant. Uh, we hope everyone enjoyed the uh, preview and sampling of Miku Summerlicious menu today. And our reservations are filling up really fast, so be sure to make yours now. A full list of participating restaurants is available online on the city's website. That's toronto.ca slash summerlicious. And that's it for our show tonight. Thanks for watching. For news anytime, you can head online to cbc.ca slash Toronto. Maribel Tarouk has your next local newscast tomorrow at 6. Have a great night.